Welcome to tonight's webinar, Protecting Maryland Drinking Water from Toxic Pollution. I'm Brian Gum, the Communications Director at the Center for Progressive Reform. CPR is an action-oriented think tank that leverages a national network of law professors and other academics with a team of analysts to drive policy change for a just America. Working alongside public interest groups and frontline communities, CPR builds policy tools and strategies to inform policymakers and support people and communities on critical issues related to health, safety, equity, and the environment. We are also looking ahead, envisioning the future direction of sound policy to protect the public, make our government work for us, and build a better, more sustainable future. Learn more on our website at progressivereform.org. Tonight's webinar will be moderated by CPR policy analyst, Caitlin Schmidt. Caitlin? Thank you everyone for joining us today on our webinar where we will discuss the, and focus on the status of drinking water protections in Maryland and how the state can better protect well owners. Joining me today are Senator Katie Hester, who represents District 9 in the Maryland General Assembly, where she sits on the Senate Education, Health, and Environmental Affairs Committee. She lives in Howard County with her husband, Bill, and two daughters. Also joining us today, Delegate Vaughn Stewart, who represents District 19 in the Maryland General Assembly, where he serves on the House Ec Environment and Transportation Committee. He lives in Derwood with his wife, Alex, and two-year-old son, Finn. And last but not least, Daria Manovi is also joining us today. She's a policy analyst at the Center for Progressive Reform. She's a public health advocate with a master's degree from the Harvard T.H. Chan School of Public Health. Before joining CPR, she worked on food policy issues at the Center for Science in the Public Interest. She's also author of a recent report highlighting nitrate pollution in Maryland's groundwater. So to start today's discussion, we're going to have a bit of a moderated Q&A with our speakers, and then we'll open it up to you all for questions. That said, feel free to type your questions in the chat box and we'll do our best to get to them at the end. So our first question, which will be directed at all of the speakers are, what is your vision for drinking water in Maryland? And one way, what is one way you are working to realize that vision in your work? I'll kick it off to Senator Hester to start us out. Caitlin, thank you so much for the question. Um, I really think it's important that homeowners and renters you know, have the support that they need to ensure that their drinking water is clean, which I know sounds simple, but there's significant work that we can that can be done. Um, it's important that homeowners you know, have the ability to test their water quality as they purchase or rent their home. Um, and I think it's also important that they're able to remediate any issues that they're finding. Um, I personally moved into an area in Maryland that's a radon hotspot. And I was surprised several years after, I mean, here, I just pulled up the, the, the map here. You can see um, all along the Northeast there, there's a huge area of, you know, of radon where it's above the, uh, the limit, which is 4,000 pico curries per liter. I probably said that wrong. But anyways, I didn't know anything about it when I moved in um, and was surprised to find it so high. So I just really think it's important that homeowners make informed decisions when they uh, buy a house or build a house on um, land that requires a private well. So I intend to be a champion for this issue in the Education, Health and Environmental Affairs Committee. Um, and I'm interested in finding solutions that are um, affordable and help everybody have equal access to clean drinking water. Great, thank you, Senator Hester. Delegate Stewart, kicking it off to you. Sure, thanks, Caitlin. So it's great to be uh, with everyone here this evening. Um, I've really enjoyed working with CPR so far on a variety of different legislative initiatives, and it's really a treat to be able to spend the evening with you guys. So for me, you know, my vision of drinking water in Maryland is pretty simple, which is that I think that clean drinking water is a fundamental human right of all people much less all Marylanders. And this, this belief really uh, is personal for me because I grew up in, in a small town in Alabama where Monsanto um, had a plant manufacturing toxins called PCBs. And without telling its workforce, much less the community, Monsanto dumped those PCBs into the water, into the drinking supply and into the air. Uh, and the PCB contamination rates in my hometown are the highest in recorded history. 
the cancer rates are sky high. And I myself have had cancer twice um, already at, at a young age. And so I can't prove a causal link, but the cancer that I'd had in 2017, non-Hodgkin lymphoma, is the cancer that's tied uh, most closely with PCV exposure. And so these issues around making sure that every community, no matter what your water source is, uh, has access to clean drinking water is just something that I feel really personally strong about. And, and in terms of what, I, what I'm working on, we're going to talk later um, in the webinar, I know about legislation that I'm working on on this subject, but this overall, this kind of um, oftentimes this tension between corporate profits um, sometimes on the one hand and human health on the other hand has been something that I've worked on um, in, in, in my brief time in the Maryland General Assembly, whether it's related to um, agricultural pollution or in the agricultural industry um, or driveway sealants. I keep coming back to this issue because at the end of the day, um, clean air and clean water are fundamental rights that we sometimes take for granted, but we have to really legislate to make them real. Great, thank you so much, Delegate Stewart. All right, next up, Daria. Thanks. Um, so I think I'm just gonna sort of go along the same train that Delegate Stewart and Senator Hester were on, but I think I share the vision of um, that all residents, regardless of whether you rely on a public water system or a private well, have access to clean and safe drinking water. I think this is something that all of us here um, can get behind. And as we'll discuss today, I think the state could be doing, uh, could be much more pre proactive in achieving this vision and taking responsibility for the ways that industrial pollution impacts people's health um, and their drinking water. Um, and my contribution in this state uh, as an environmental health advocate has been assessing water quality data from the state and counties and making that information easily digestible by um, anyone who's interested to learn about this issue. And uh, as we did with our tainted tap report, and we'll talk about later today, um, and also just reviewing the latest public health research on how certain contaminants can impact people's health. Thanks. Thank you. Alrighty, so um, this question is directed at Senator Hester. Um, and so for those who may be new, what is the Safe Drinking Water Act and what kinds of water systems does it apply to? So the Safe Drinking Water Act is primarily federal statute governing the health of you know, our nation's drinking water. And under the Safe Drinking Water Act, the EPA, the Environmental Protection Agency, must set enforceable drinking water standards for various contaminants found in drinking water. And that is what you see on the screen to my left. Um, in order to protect public health, the act requires public water suppliers to regularly test their water and ensure that any contaminants found do not reach the maximum thresholds established by the EPA. And while the act does a lot to ensure that drinking water supplied to the public water supplier is safe to drink, the statute's protections do not extend to private drinking wells and smaller community-based systems. And that means systems which serve fewer than 25 individuals or at least 15 service connections. So that's the Safe Drinking Water Act in a nutshell. Great, thank you so much. Did anyone else have anything to add? All right, we'll hop on to the next question. Delegate Stewart, does Maryland have any laws to protect private well owners? That's an easy uh, question. Basically, no. Maryland has been consistently ranked in the bottom tier of the country on its regulations and protections that we have um, in existence for, for private well owners. We, we regulate you know, water and access to clean water in a variety of other ways, but this, this specific area often has fallen between the cracks. Great, thank you so much. Daria, just as a follow-up to that, how does Maryland um, compare to protections available in other states more specifically? Yeah, so I think Delegate Stewart explained that very well, that uh, there isn't really much in Maryland, uh, you know, in, for, in terms of private well regulation, um, well, when a well is drilled, there are certain requirements around construction, abandonment, and maintenance of that well, and, you know, you must require a permit um, if you're interested in uh, drilling a well. Um, and uh, for anyone who's intending to use a well for drinking water, you do have to obtain a certificate of potability um, that does have certain drinking water limits associated with it. So you do get a well test when you are drilling that well for the first time. But outside of that, there isn't really much that the state provides. So um, 
you know, as we were working on our tainted tap report um, and, and researching this issue of private well regulation, we kept coming across these sort of common sense programs that many other states have implemented pr to protect private well owners. And we were really curious how Maryland compared. So we completed a national scan of 10 key policies and programs that states have implemented to protect private well owners. These include things like providing low cost or free water testing kits to well owners, providing grants to clean up contaminated wells, requiring landlords to test private wells and disclose those results to tenants, um, operating a groundwater protection program, having a public online database um, with well testing results, very common sense um, initiatives. Um, and as you can see on the slide, um, we found that Maryland is actually among the five states with the fewest protective policies in the country, like Delegate Stewart was saying. Alongside Alaska, Georgia, Pennsylvania, and West Virginia, Maryland has only one protection in place, which is that initial well water quality test uh, that you get when you uh, have that when the well is initially drilled. At some point, um, the Maryland Department of Environment did also operate um, a groundwater protection program that monitored and annually reported on the state's groundwater resources, um, which are what supply private wells, but they haven't reported on that program since 2013. So other than issuing permits to potential groundwater polluters, it's very unclear to what extent MDE is protecting, monitoring, and reporting on groundwater. To share some examples, some specific examples of what other states are doing, uh, neighboring Delaware offers a $4 water testing kit to private well owners. New Jersey requires landlords to test their wells every five years and disclose those results to tenants. Um, in Virginia, there's a household water quality program run out of Virginia Tech that provides free testing. And um, I think we found, uh, and Caitlin, you might agree that the Midwest was kind of the gold standard in this space. They've got pretty robust programs uh, related to well water. So in states like Iowa and Wisconsin, they administer grant programs uh, to provide financial assistance to remediate contaminated wells or to treat uh, well water. And then Iowa also has a public well water tracking database. So there is certainly a lot that the state of Maryland could be doing to protect private well owners. Yeah. Great, Daria. Um, and just to sort of add to that, you know, Iowa's program is, is really great, and they only have about 200,000 well owners in that state, as opposed to the 2 million Maryland, Marylanders here. So we, we can step it up. All right, so the next question um, is also directed at Daria. What are the implications for this lack of protections on Maryland well owners? Yeah, so um, as you can imagine, this doesn't bode well for private well owners um, in Maryland. Outside of that initial water quality test, uh, when your well is drilled, the responsi responsibility really falls on you to ensure the safety of your drinking water, which is you know similar to Senator Hester's experience with radon in her drinking water. Um, and we're concerned that this hands-off approach could really be harming people's health. So um, first, while MDE, as uh, they have a, well, a Be Well Wise program, essentially sort of like an educational outreach program on how to operate and manage your well, um, they recommend that well owners test their water annually, but our research suggests this isn't happening. In a recent survey that we completed with residents on the Lower Eastern Shore, where many folks rely on private wells nearly 75% of respondents said they had never tested their well water or hadn't done so in over a year. And when, they, when we asked them why they hadn't tested their water, the most common response was, I didn't know I needed to test my water. Um, also, while county health departments do offer sort of information and well testing services when requested, these tests can be between 50 to hundreds of dollars. And in our survey, we also found an inverse relationship between testing frequency and household income, meaning that lower income families may be less aware of potential contamination if they're testing their water less frequency. So without resources for testing or a public database that's making this information available, there is a lot we don't know about the safety of private wells. And to us, this sort of what you don't know won't hurt you approach isn't really helping anyone. Great. So this question is also directed at you, Daria. Um, so you and I recently co-authored a report that we've been referencing. We'll make sure to link that in the chat for those who haven't seen it. But our report assessed nitrate contamination on the Lower Eastern Shore. Could you share what you uncovered about the extent of nitrate contamination in private wells in that region? Yeah, sure. 
So for those who aren't aware, nitrates are a colorless, odorless, and tasteless compound that are often found in groundwater, especially in agricultural areas. They're formed when nitrogen from fertilizer or manure, for example, breaks down. Nitrogen is, of course, uh, absorbed by plants you know, when, when it's applied to fields. But if manure is overapplied or it's mismanaged, excess nitrates can percolate into groundwater or they can run off into surface waters. Um, and so we decided to focus on Maryland's Lower Eastern Shore for our report because it's where the state's industrial poultry operations are concentrated. Chicken houses produce an immense amount of litter, and while the state does operate a manure transport program, data suggests that agriculture is the most significant contributor of nitrogen to Maryland's waterways. The number of poultry operations has also skyrocketed in the over the last uh, decade. In 2009, there were about nine registered poultry farms in the state, and as of October 1st of last year, there were 526, with over half concentrated in Somerset, Wicomico, and Worcester counties on the lower shore. Based on um, conversations with county health departments and EPA data, we estimate that between one to two thirds of lower shore residents rely on private wells. It's, it's been quite hard to find an exact number, but um, to complete our assessment, I acquired water quality um, or water testing data from those three counties. Uh, this is again, that data is from when the well is drilled um, and the data quality varied where, for example, Worcester County had a very complete database, a spreadsheet they were able to send me from thousands of wells that were tested, whereas Wicomico and Somerset were only able to send me scans of paper records from about 100 wells each. So definitely um, variation in record keeping. Um, but from all the data provided, we found that in Wicomico and Worcester County, roughly one out of 14 wells that have been tested since 1965 had nitrate levels above EPA's federal drinking water limit of 10 milligrams per liter. And none of the wells that we assessed in Somerset County um, exceeded this level. Again, it was a small sample of data, but uh, worth noting. Um, that being said, the federal drinking water limit for nitrates was set back in 1962, and this was set based on an even older study and epidemiological studies that have been completed since then have indicated that EPA's limit may not even be protective enough. So when we applied a more stringent limit of three milligrams per liter, we found that one out of 10 wells in these two counties had nitrate levels that may be hazardous to people's health over time. While the data is, is alarming and, and requires further exploration, it only provides a snapshot of what nitrate levels were when that well was drilled. And without incentives for testing or systematic groundwater monitoring, we really don't know how safe people's drinking water is. And this is especially concerning with nitrates. Data from the US Geological Survey suggests that nitrate concentrations in groundwater in the region have increased over time. And the Maryland Geological Survey has stated that nitrate levels as low as three milligrams per liter um, indicate that there are human made sources of nitrate and that those levels can increase over time. Furthermore, in that uh, last report published by the Maryland Groundwater Protection Program, which we mentioned earlier, hasn't um, sort of reported on anything since 2013, uh, MDE stated that, quote, due to agricultural land use practices, nitrate concentrations in shallow waters of the unconfined aquifers on Maryland's eastern shore commonly exceed the federal drinking water standard of 10 milligrams per liter. The, the report went on to say that private residential wells are not monitored regularly and many homeowners are not aware of potential contamination. So, all signs are really um, indicating that there may be a very real issue with nitrates and drinking water on the lower shore, but that there's also a clear and uh, frankly unacceptable gap between what the state is aware of and what's being communicated and provided to private well owners in order to safeguard their health. Great, thank you so much. Um, and just as a quick follow up um, to that, what are the health impacts of consuming nitrates? You didn't really hit on that um, in, in your drinking water. Yeah, so the primary condition that's most commonly associated with nitrate consumption in drinking water is met hemoglobinemia or blue baby syndrome, which is a condition fatal to infants under six months of age through oxygen deprivation. Um, EPA's drinking water limit uh, for nitrates is set at a level to prevent blue baby syndrome, but uh, since that level was set in 1962, there have been reported cases of blue baby syndrome at levels below 10 milligrams per liter. And as I mentioned earlier, there have been many studies, especially over the last 20 years or so, that have found an association between nitrate concentration and certain types of cancer, especially colorectal cancer, as well as pregnancy complications and thyroid disease. 
And in many studies, these adverse effects are found at levels well below EPA's limit of 10 milligrams per liter. More research is certainly needed to understand how this could impact Marylanders or is impacting Marylanders, but the Lower Shore counties uh, have some of the highest rates of colon cancer and infant mortality in the state. Of course, we can't draw a straight line uh, between nitrate consumption and these conditions, um, and they could certainly be related to other factors like income or access to healthcare services, but I will note that a very recent study was published uh, like this month um, in the International Journal of Environmental Research and Public Health found an association between between well water usage and cancer cases on the Lower Eastern Shore. And additionally, colon cancer patients were more likely to rely on well water than public water. So again, this is something that really um, requires further analysis, analysis to see if there are some real um, effects on people's health. Thanks. Thank you so much. Our Delegate Stewart, um, after CPR released its report, you expressed an interest in pursuing common sense reforms to protect private well owners. And together we drafted a bill that will create a well safety program in Maryland um, with plans to introduce this during the 2021 leg legislative session. What will the Maryland private well safety program do and how will it protect private well owners? Yeah, absolutely. Well, I mean, as I'm sure that many of you listening and watching tonight, uh, like like many of you, I mean, I was alarmed by this report, you know, this idea that this colorless, odorless, tasteless substance is lurking in the wells of so many Marylanders, and yet we, the state and the legislature has done so little to remedy this. And so what the bill does is fairly simple. It essentially creates a well safety insurance program. So it would impose a small fee, I think it would come out for an average homeowner to be something like 50 or 60 bucks on homeowners when they purchase a home with a private well. And then the fee would create a funding stream to help cover the cost of both well tests, which can be expensive and are a barrier uh, for a lot of homeowners, and remediation of wells uh, when they have been determined to be contaminated. As has been mentioned already, remediation is extremely expensive outside the budgets of, of many families who, who, even if they got their wells tested and found out that they were contaminated, wouldn't necessarily have the resources to fix the problem. Uh, the bill also crucially would create a public database of well water test results, and then it would also require property owners to disclose any results to both any buyer, any potential buyers, and also tenants uh, living on the property. And I just wanted to put a fine point on, you know, what we heard from Daria a second ago, which is that I really think Maryland's hands-off approach to this, to, to this issue, to private wells, hurts people uh, with low wealth and people of color, working class people the most. Poverty rates in the counties that are most affected uh, by nitrates in, in private wells, Somerset, Wicomico, Worcester, are higher than the state average. And Somerset and Wicomico have the highest proportion of black residents on the Eastern shore. And as we all know, you know, communi communities in general with higher proportions of black and brown and lower income residents um, you know, not only have a higher um, incidences of, of, you know, comorbidities and negative health outcomes, but they also on the shore um, live closer to industrial livestock operations. And so these, these economic and, and racial injustices are informing and widening health disparities. And so I, I feel strongly that Maryland should no longer turn a blind eye to allowing these harmful pollutants to live um, in our in private wells that can exacerbate these injustices. And so even though we can't, you know, see them or smell them or taste them, they're there and they're hurting us. And, uh, and as I said at the start, safe drinking water is and really should be a uh, human right for all Marylanders. And we must, we've got to make sure that all Marylanders have access to it. And I think this program would be a small step in that direction. And I'm happy to introduce it and to work with CPR and hopefully work with several of you on this call to, um, to help get it across the finish line this session. Great, thank you so much for that. Alrighty, um, anything else on the last question before I move on from the other speakers? All right, sounds good. All right, so 
Um, our last question, and then we'll open up um, the, Q, the Q and A section of this webinar is how can attendees on this call support the Maryland Private Well Safety Program during the 2021 legislative session? And I'm gonna first kick this off to Senator Hester um, and we'll also switch screens so that we can show you a hands-on approach to sort of how you can get involved this year. Thanks, Caitlin. Um, I think in general, there, there's two ways anybody listening can help to support this effort. You know, the first is to advocate with your own personal delegates and senators and tell them this issue is really important to you. The second thing you can do is to sign up and provide written testimony or sign up to provide oral testimony um, on the MGA website. And that's why we've pulled it up this year uh, on the screen here. Um, Things are a little different this year. So for some of you, it's gonna be easier to testify because you can do it on Zoom. Um, but you do have to make sure that you sign up um, in the right way. And so I was just gonna give you a little tutorial here. Um, there's a tiny red box in the upper right-hand corner of your screen when you navigate to that page. And you would click on that box, the My MGA box, and that's where it, you can start to provide testimony. Once you're logged into your My MGA account, um, you will see a screen that says bill tracking lists. And there there's a series of options and a stack of white boxes on the left side of your screen. So you go over there, click on the second box down where it says witness sign up, and we got it. Um, and now if you try it now, you're not gonna see anything because you have to do it between the hours of 10 a.m. and 3 p.m. And you're only going to be able to find your uh, legislation two days before uh, the, the, the day of the hearing. Um, but you can, um, let me see. But once you're there, you'll be able to see Delegate Vaughn Stewart's name and the bill title next to it. And then you can click on it and say, um, you'll have a, a chance to say your position in the middle box there. And you'll choose favorable, hopefully, um, and then testimony. And so you indicate your position, you say what type of testimony you wanna provide, whether it's written or oral. And then you finally scroll to the top of your screen and you make sure that you hit the red save button. Um, I'd also like to note that we've had some issues with this not working on Internet Explorer. So um, just make sure that you have a computer or a device that doesn't use that browser. Um, and if you have any questions, I just call um, my office, call Delegate Von Stewart's office, and one of our great uh, staff people can help walk you through the process. Um, it's it's if you haven't done it before, it's not easy. But then what? Like anything else, once you've done it a few times, it gets easier. So feel free to reach out. But we could really use your support on this bill. Um, and really, we could use, it could be great once we have the bill number, if you can write to your own legislators and tell them how important it is to the entire state of Maryland to have safe drinking water. Great. Thank you so much, Senator Hester. Delegate Stewart. Sure. Well, first, I just wanted to thank Senator Hester for her leadership on this issue and on so many others. I really appreciate her partnership on this legislation and on a number of other related things. Senator Hester and I actually both serve on the phosphorus management tool working group related to phosphorus pollution in the Bay coming from industrial agriculture operations. And she's been a great partner and really a tremendous leader on a variety of issues. So I appreciate spending the evening with her and just her help in general. Um, and she gave a great a great summary of, of how to get involved and how to write written testimony. I'll just add a couple of things. So, so first, when it comes to sending emails to your legislators about this issue or any other that you feel strongly, strongly about, the best heuristic that I would say to use is that the more time and thought it takes you to write an email, the better it's going to be received. So even though there may be opportunities on this bill or on other bills to sort of do a copy and paste job, and send kind of the same email that a bunch of other people are going to do. And that's fine. You know, I'm not saying don't do that. It's much more effective if you can write a personalized email in your own voice, tying in your own story and your own perspective. That's always going to catch a delegate or a senator's eye a lot more than an email that they see reproduced a couple of dozen times in a row. Um, and I would also say that, you know, identify where you live. If you live in the legislator's district, make sure they know that. If you had you know, your, their yard sign in your yard, make sure they know that. If you voted for them, even if it wasn't in the primary, if you voted for them in the general, make sure they know all that information that ties you to them. If you met them that one time at the grocery store, tell them. And if, and if you email someone who, whose district you don't live in, then um, just be vague about where you live. Honestly, I, I advise people to do that all the time. If you live, for example, in Montgomery County, Silver Spring, 
as a moniker represents like half the county. So even if you don't specifically live in my district, if you say you live in Silver Spring, I don't know that for a fact. And so I just kind of treat you implicitly as a constituent. Um, so don't necessarily lie or be dishonest about where you live, but you can be vague. And sometimes um, because legislators care most about their neighbor's opinion, um, you can influence policy a little bit more that way. Uh, but yeah, be specific with your emails. And then when it comes to written testimony, even if you don't have feel like you have a whole lot to say and you don't, or you're not in the mood or you don't have enough time during these kind of tumultuous times we're living in to write a full treatise on the subject. Even a couple of lines in written testimony can make an impact just because the way we view it as legislators, we view the software, it basically lines up all the testimony that's favorable and all the testimony that's unfavorable on sort of a screen. And so even if the legislator doesn't take the time to click and read every single document, which you know, it's pretty common not to read every single one. Just a flood of having written testimony that's favorable on an issue just looks more imposing and impressive when we pull up the bill list. And I'm convinced at least that it has a sort of subtle, you know, maybe, uh, you know, un, you know, um, imperceptible um, effect on legislators because when they gear up for a hearing and they see 18 people have signed up favorable and two have signed up unfavorable, it just kind of predisposes them that, oh, well, maybe this is something that's really popular. Whereas if the numbers are reversed, it's going to predispose them in a negative light and they're going to sort of see that hearing um, through a more negative lens. So those were the only two points I would add. But again, anything, anything you can do to help would be appreciated. I'll drop, and I'm sure Senator Hester would also, will also drop our emails in the chat, um, but and we can follow up, you know, in the other ways to provide you with our emails. But if you have any difficulty either reaching out to people, you want to know who you who you email, who your legislators are, you're having trouble trouble with the you know online software. We're here and, and happy to walk you through any any aspect of the process. Great, that's really helpful. Alrighty, so. I'm going to go ahead and switch um, my view just so you all, um, I can look at the questions that were asked. Um, but one of the first questions that we got, which actually wasn't asked here, but we were asked um, prior to the webinar was, um, have there been any incidents reported of blue baby syndrome in Maryland or associated areas? Yeah, so um, that is actually something that I looked into uh, when researching this report, because that would, of course, be a very helpful indicator of potential um, nitrate contamination. But uh, there is unfortunately no public database um, on blue baby syndrome. I think that's another issue to potentially address and would uh, probably be something that hospitals have. And I know they're not giving out those records for free. So um, unfortunately, we don't have that data available. Great. Thank you, Daria. All right, um, next question is, what is your position on regulating agricultural waste application and the influence on groundwater? Um, this is particularly important in areas where industrial scale animal production occurs. Yeah, I'm happy to start on this one. Um, you know, my position is that certainly, you know, the, I think the, the agricultural industry in Maryland and the poultry industry in particular provides a lot of jobs, you know, and benefits to the state for sure. But at the same time, the unmitigated growth that we've seen in the last decade plus in particular, I think has gotten untenable in a lot of different ways. I mean, I think it's meant more and more pollution to the Bay. I mean, we're already having trouble managing the amount of chicken litter on the Bay given current rates with our manure transport program. It's a huge problem. There's been talk about delaying the phosphorus management program and the tool that was passed just because the status quo is always is already proven to be difficult to manage. And if, if the industry continues to grow a pace where you're continuing to see these massive facilities open up year after year after year and the number of birds uh, that are processed goes up year after year after year, then I really sort of shudder to think if we can't manage the status quo in 2021, how are we possibly going to manage it in 2031 or 2041? And so I had a bill this last session in 2020 that actually would imp would have imposed a short term a short term short short term that is so weirdly uh, tough word to pronounce um, moratorium um, on the uh, on the largest of the poultry facilities because I think that especially you know with all the concerns about the impending climate crisis anything we can do as state legislators to try to bring this system 
um, down to size so that local farmers are empowered and that big corporate agribusiness can't just continue to rack, rack up massive profits, but with externalities, with environmental externalities that the rest of us have to shoulder in a variety of ways. I think that's positive. So I, I've been a big believer in trying to sort of promote more sustainable forms of agriculture and empower local farmers. Um, and I think we can do that in a way that it does not cripple uh, the industry. Great, thank you, Delegate Stewart. All right, so next up is a question from Jean Holloway, and I'm just gonna quickly answer this one because I think we addressed it um, previously, but she asks, what can I as a homeowner with a well do to advocate for subsidies for testing our well water on a regular basis? It costs an upward of $150 currently for bacteria, lead, and nitrate testing. Is it feasible for the state to subsidize that testing? Um, so that's exactly what we're hoping to do with the Maryland Well Safety Program, um, because we've found that these testing can be really cost prohibitive, especially for low income residents that may be, um, you know, disproportionately impacted um, by this pollution in their drinking water. Um, so we're, we're really hoping to achieve just that with this legislation to ensure that testing happens on a more regular basis, but we're also building a record of the types of contaminants that are found in, in groundwater in specific areas in the state. Um, yeah, what a perfect question, right? She's like perfectly set up the rest of the presentation. Couldn't have been done, it couldn't have been done better. Exactly, so thank you for that one. Um, all right, so the next question up is, is there an effort or momentum to create statutory private rights of action for well contamination? Um, so this is a tricky one. I don't know if any of the speakers wanna jump in on this one. I'm happy to answer it as well. Yeah, I mean, you know, I, I'm, I'm an attorney, but not a very good one. I don't know um, what the exact legal framework is right now for trying to hold, you know, polluters accountable for nitrate levels in drinking water. I would imagine that causation would be really difficult to prove um, that, oh, this particular, you know, business is the one whose, you know, contamination is the one that, that led to the nitrates in my drinking water. Even, you know, even if you had a private right of action, I just think it would be a difficult lawsuit to bring. But it's a great question. I mean, I think, and I think it could go a long way. I mean, I'm a big believer that you know, making the access to the courthouse easier for plaintiffs who have been aggrieved can help deter uh, corporate malfeasance. Um, and so I think it, it's a good idea. I mean, I think it's a good avenue for us to explore in the future. And I just wanted to jump in and say that I'm, I'm not aware of any other legislation besides, you know, this really excellent bill the Delegate Vaughn Stewart's bringing forward that addresses drinking water. I mean, I think it's long overdue in the state of Maryland. And so, um, you know, obviously if there's other stuff out there that we find, <laughs> we can send it out to the attendees, but I, I'm not, the bills that I've seen so far coming through EHE haven't addressed that yet. Great, thank you both. All righty. Um, so here's an, a question, um, and I'll direct this one at Daria. For clarification, there is much mention of private wells. Are there public wells or do water treatment programs and water reservoirs encompass that? Yeah, so um, there are wells that supply public water systems. Um, so I'm not sure, I, I haven't come across any sort of like public well in terms of drinking water. Uh, so we're talking about a private well, really like, in, you know, thinking about someone who has a well situated on their property and that is supplying the drinking water for their household. Great, thank you for that. Um, all righty, uh, the next one, and I'll, I'll take this one too, is isn't there a significant difference in the number of registered poultry farms from 2009 to the present, largely due to the fact that they were not identified as CAFOs in 2009 and are now required to register? Um, so yes, that is that is somewhat true. Um, on This sort of has to do with how the Clean Water Act and the federal EPA regulates CAFOs. Um, there was a lot of litigation around this issue and whether or not the 
Clean Water Act even apply to CAFOs in the first place. Um, but we did get some clarification after 2009, and more and more CAFOs that were existing at that time had registered in the system. We did see a really big increase, though, in the number of operations from 2014 to 2016. Um, I don't know the specific numbers off the top of my head, but it, it was in the hundreds that happened at that time. Um, so if that person, I know you're anonymous, but if you'd like to follow up with me via email, I'd, I'd be happy to um, talk with you more about that issue. Alrighty. The next question up is, are there known health issues associated with bathing in water containing nitrogen? Um, I guess I could probably take this one. I am not aware of any issues. Uh, my understanding is that the sort of primary route of exposure is through ingestion. So unless you're drinking the water while you're bathing in it, there shouldn't be any issue with dermal exposure. Um, I admittedly have not done much research on sort of uh, skin contact with nitrogen containing water, but I, I don't think that it is a huge concern. Great, thank you. I'll just add from my experience being a homeowner that with radon that we have in our water, they advised us not only to treat the drinking water, but also to treat the water used in the house because it could be dangerous to bathe in it. That's for radon though. Yeah, with radon, there's a sort of, uh, um, what's it called? Uh, you can sort of, uh, ex you're exposed through breathing it in as well. Um, I don't think it's the same with nitrate, but of course it varies from contaminant to contaminant. Great, thank you, Daria. Um, all right, Brent Walls asks, are, is there any information on groundwater issues in karst geology regions? Washington County, Maryland has karst and nitrates that are at a mid to high level between five to 10 milligrams per liter. Daria, do you know that one? Yeah, so since we focused on the lower shore, I didn't um, sort of dive into other regions. Uh, so I, I don't know, I can't answer that on whether it's an issue, but I think that this uh, something we can look into and I think certainly just makes a greater case for this bill if this is an issue in other regions in the state. Alrighty. Just on that last point, I mean, I would love to see a situation where we had kind of a map of our groundwater across the entire state. It would also help us with interstate politics. Like we, we we're currently suing Pennsylvania over not complying with uh, the, the laws that govern the Chesapeake Bay. And if we could test our groundwater along the Pennsylvania border, we'd have even more proof that, you know, they're polluting our watershed. Great point. Okay, Jonathan Nace asks, have you looked into the role or potential for land application of sewage sludge to be a co-contributor to contaminated private wells in addition to what we think of as industrial agriculture? I don't believe um, on the CPR side of things that we've looked into this very issue. Um, I don't know if any of the other speakers wanna to speak to that or we'll just have to follow up via email on that one. All right, sounds like... Well, one thing I could add, so yeah, we did not look into that question on CPRs end, but I think that was in part uh, because there was so much research pointing to the fact that agricultural contributions are such a significant contributor that um, sort of that's where we focused our attention. USGS specifically has a report that came out in 2015 that sort of summarized that about 90% of the nitrogen that's in the Eastern shore waterways comes from um, agriculture. Sure. And so that's sort of, that's, you know, what something again, I think sewage is another issue certainly worth looking into, but um, just with our resources did not dive into that question. All right. Uh, next question is, you mentioned the Safe Drinking Water Act. Is there any other federal legislation that can help with these efforts, not just in Maryland? So we looked at the Clean Water Revolving Loan Fund, which provides working capital for a wide range of water infrastructure projects, including publicly owned uh, treatment work, stormwater improvements, and decentralized wastewater treatment systems. But I think there's a need at the federal level to do more to support private um, and small community drinking water, water wells. Yeah, I agree. All righty. Next up, um, in response to Jean's question, would a homeowner who did not contribute to the funding stream mentioned be eligible for well remediation insurance? Yes. 
Yes, because the, the it's funded by when homes are sold. Um, so the the fund you know basically gets gets revenue um, as people pay the fee as they buy homes more and more. But just because you haven't bought or sold a home in 20 years doesn't mean you're ineligible for the program. So the answer is yes. Um, if you've if you haven't gone through real estate, if you've been lucky enough not to have to move recently, um, but but as long as the the um, fund has been funded by some fees and has a revenue stream coming in, you can still access that for both testing or remediation. Great. All righty. Um, next question is, does technology exist to remove nitrogen from water pumped from wells? Yeah, so um, unfortunately, uh, nitrates uh, can't be removed through sort of uh, chemical processes or boiling. Um, it uh, requires more expensive technology like reverse osmosis, uh, which is sort of a gold standard if you're worried about any contaminant in your water. Unfortunately, um, RO systems are really expensive. Um, so if someone's looking into it, I would recommend getting it for just your kitchen sink, for example, which is slightly cheaper. And of course, the hope um, with this bill is that there, you know, if there is funding for remediation and treatment, that there could be per support provided to homeowners uh, for treatment systems if you have a contaminated well. One of the things I think would be really helpful is if if we knew what the what the water was like when we were building that, like our house, you could have put in a system to. Uh, negate the effects and then have it amortized over the mortgage. And so I think that there is room for improvement, um, you know, for new home builders, um, but then also having this, the state fund um, for the remediation is another way to offset the cost because everybody, everybody deserves clean water, whether they can afford it or not. That's a great point. Okay, next question up is, do you have specific regulatory legislation planned for controlling the impacts of the poultry industry? Um, well, as I mentioned earlier, last session I introduced a bill. I'm not bringing it back this session just because I'm focusing on other more COVID-related or immediately COVID-related legislation, so I'm not in reintroducing it. But last year I did have a bill that would have imposed a short term, a short term, I can't, I can, literally cannot pronounce the word, short term moratorium on, um, on the largest uh, CAFOs in the state, the very largest that have the most number of birds. But there was a number of, um, of, of different ideas that we could pursue. Um, in 2019, I um, successfully passed a bill along with Senator Pinsky of Prince George's County to create a better enforcement regime for the transporting of manure to make sure that we could track it better. And that passed and that's gone into effect that's helped limit some of the worst excesses of the industry. This session, I'm also uh, pushing a bill that's not specifically environmental in nature, but I'm introducing a bill about farm workers. We know that poultry processing facilities were the site of um, huge COVID outbreaks back in the spring. And one of the reasons that happened is not just because the workplace conditions were not um, super sanitary or safe, but because farm workers in these large poultry plants oftentimes live in unsafe, uh, unsanitary housing, uh, employer-provided housing. Um, and so I have a bill that would basically provide inspections, regular inspections for the first time um, of farm worker housing to make sure that the people who are making our food have a safe place to live. And so while that would not directly provide some sort of environmental link to the, to the poultry and to the agriculture and industry, it would make sure that you know, they have to internalize the costs of their business. Um, and that means that we can't just get you know, I don't think we should get really cheap chicken on the backs of exploiting the workforce. Thank you, Delegate Stewart. And I'll just add to that the um, private well safety program that Delegate Stewart is sponsoring in Maryland also has a um, groundwater source tracking program component to it. Um, so it would essentially require MDE to better study and monitor the state of our groundwater resources that are sourcing these private wells um, and get a better handle on the extent of the contamination and identify what the sources of contamination are. Um, we've got you know, a pretty good idea that um, the poultry operations on the Lower Eastern Shore are contributing to nitrate contamination and groundwater resources. Um, I think MDE and the United States Geological Survey agree with that. Um, 
but you know we don't we don't have a, a really great sense of the extent to it and specifically sort of where that contamination is directly coming from. Um, so this bill would really require the Maryland Department of the Environment to really get a better handling um, of the, the sources of nitrate contamination in our groundwater resources, along with any other harmful contaminants um, that may be toxic to your health. Um, so a related question to that is, can you speak to why agriculture would be such a dominant source of nitrate contamination of drinking water? Aren't poultry operations, for example, supposed to follow nutrient management plans and aren't those plans supposed to protect against just this kind of pollution? So the answer is yes, the nutrient management plans, when they're followed, should protect the bay and, and, and folks' wells and just watersheds generally along the shore from nitrates and other you know, nutrients. Um, however, we know that a lot of farmers are not abiding by the nutrient management um, uh, rules that the state has put in place. Uh, the, the phosphorus management tool, the PMT, has not been fully implemented for um, a lot of the, especially the smaller farms. Um, and we also know that not every single farmer is reporting data under the, M M or under the PMT. So they're, um, they're in violation by not reporting. And we you know, can readily assume that the reason they're not reporting is because they're not actually abiding by it. So in other words, um, if everyone obeyed, by, obeyed the rules and if the rules were fully rolled out, then nitrates in private wells would be um, a smaller problem, um, but not everyone's playing by the rules. I just um, want to say that the, yes, there are there are bad actors out there. Um, I, I would say a majority of our, our farmers you know, do follow the rules though. And as you started off by saying, Delegate Stewart, they're a really important part of our economy and they do much better than the farmers in Pennsylvania. So I think it's, um, I just wanted to kind of balance out the, uh, the, 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 the comment about the nutrient management plans. Um, I think um, that's it. <laughs> yeah, it's a small minority. I think, I think actually it, initially it was like 20% of farms weren't reporting and now that number is down to five. So, I mean, you're absolutely right that I think uh, in terms of technological advances, Maryland has led the country. Um, you know, farmers have been extremely, uh, as a whole, receptive to the rules that Maryland has put in place. But there is a small minority of, of farmers who have re resisted it tooth and nail. Um, right. And they, they tend to be, you know, the largest source of these nutrients that we're talking about. So we need to get those bad actors. Um, I also chair the Cyber IT and Biotech Committee. And one of the things we've talked a lot about is precision agriculture and how with the advances in technology, you can really, really carefully, uh, you know, uh, use your nutrients on specific places, uh, parts of your, you know, the field so that it's kind of changing and you're getting the exact number of nutrients. So there's a lot of great stuff going on and we just need to make sure that we're, you know, get, get that last 5% of the bad actors. Thank you. I appreciate that. And then um, I think second to last question is, is there any evidence of PFAS contamination of private wells for wells that are in close proximity to military bases in the state? And if not, will the state of Maryland study this? I do not know the answer to that, um, but I am I think that you know, I'm, I really like to have data. And so um, I'd be happy to follow up with whoever asked that question offline and just try to do a little digging and see what has been done or what could be done to study that. It's a very interesting question. Does anybody else know the answer? Not on. Not there way. has been, there, there are some, there's sorry, there's some um, evidence to uh, like studies completed uh, by the federal government that have found high levels of PFAS near military sites in Maryland. Um, but I think, again, uh, due to some of these limitations in well water testing, there really hasn't been much testing. Um, uh, I don't think anyone's going out of their way to test for PFAS unless you're very aware of it because it's not regulated under the Safe Drinking Water Act um, and you might not be aware of it as an issue. So I think, I don't know if there's much uh, we know about well contamination. I do know that the state was planning to do some monitoring of public water systems, um, but I'm not sure where that is currently. 
Thank you, Daria. And hopefully the ground water source protection program um, that will be built into Delegate Stewart's bill may shed a light on some of the PFAS contamination issues, um, as well as I know Veronica Carella asked um, about the application of pesticides as well. And we're hoping that that groundwater source protection program will, will really shed a light on, on all of these different types of contaminants that may be found in our drinking water. All right, so last question um, is, how does the proliferation of impervious surfaces created by development and road expansion impact this issue and water quality in general? And I'm happy to take that one on if... All right, so I'll, I'll go ahead and just speak to that along with the karst geology question. So for folks that don't know, um, karst geology is this sand-like, rock-like substance that's really found out in, in Western Maryland um, beneath the surface. And so that type of sort of surface um, does lead to more groundwater contamination just because unlike other soil that may be thicker essentially and absorb will be more likely to absorb any pollutants that may be coming through. Um, so um, this question is related to sort of impervious surfaces and um, road expansion. Um, so I'm not exactly sure sort of how to answer that one um, specifically, but um, you know, feel free to follow up with me via email um, if there's sort of a little bit more specific with sort of more information on specifically what you're looking for there. Um, but you know, I'm sure that I know that there's sort of chemicals that can be found on roadways and that can lead to runoff, which then can contaminate our groundwater resources. Um, but other than that, um, I'm not really sure sort of how it, how it impacts water quality more broadly. So thank you all. Thank you um, to Senator Hester and Delegate Stewart and Daria for, for joining us today. Um, thank you to the attendees for hopping on and answering such great, or um, asking such great questions. It's been a pleasure. Um, I'm going to head, go ahead and share my screen now just so you all have our contact information. If you have any more follow-up questions, feel free to reach out to me. I know Delegate Stewart and Senator Hester also linked their emails via chat. So they're um, also available for any sort of questions related to the legislation or other drinking water issues um, facing Marylanders. So thank you all again, I appreciate it. Thanks, Caitlin. Thank you so much. It's a pleasure spending the evening with you. Thank you all, a lot of fun.